Okay, folks, it's time to do it. Let's finally answer that question of, do muscle fiber types change? Well, I want to start by highlighting some really interesting initial work in this area. So a famous study done in 1960, really clever. What they did is they took motor units. Now, to, to explain what that is briefly, a motor unit is an alpha motor neuron and all the muscle fibers that it innervates. So in other words, the nerve, and how all the fibers that it activates and turns on. So what he did is, and it's important to sort of know at the background here, all of the muscles, all the fibers in a motor unit are of the same fiber type. So another way to think about that is the fiber type is determined by which type of neuron activates it. Okay, so if it is a type one or a slow twitch neuron, if you will, all the fibers in that motor unit are going to be slow twitch fibers. And if it's fast twitch, be fast twitch fibers. So what they did in this famous study is they came in and said, okay, we'll take a slow uh, neuron, slow motor unit that, is inter that normally innervates and activates slow twitch fibers, and we'll take some that are fast twitch and we'll cross them. So what we'll do here is we'll cut the fast twitch neuron and attach it to the slow twitch fibers, and we'll cut the slow twitch neuron and attach it to the fast twitch fibers. And then we'll watch to see what happens. Well, it turns out the slow twitch fibers that were attached now to the fast twitch neuron converted and turned themselves into the, other, into the neuron fiber type. And the same thing happened to the other one. And so they converted. So we've actually known since 1960 that there are physiological normative mechanisms that allow for muscle fiber types to change. So in fact, that's not ever really been the question, at least from not for the last 60 years or so. We know that they can change. The real question has been, oh, okay, that's never going to happen in a human. We're not going to cut a nerve and attach it to another one. So we know mechanisms exist that are, in fact, we know them now that are these mole certain molecules called NFATs that are excreted from the neurons that actually cause the fiber type to change. We've known it actually happens in, in, without cutting a nerve too. So there's a phenomenon called fiber type grouping. So normally, as I mentioned, not only are all the fibers in a motor unit of the same fiber type, but they're not necessarily laying directly next to each other. So if I have a, say, motor unit that has five muscle fibers in it, those five fibers are not going to be laying directly next to each other. They're probably going to be spread out throughout the muscle. This allows control of fine motor movements. Well, in pathological situations such as aging or certain diseases, we get what we call fiber type grouping. So what happens here is the neuron, for whatever reason, dies off, but the fibers are still viable. And so the neighboring neurons are, are essentially communicated with or are made aware that the neuron is dead. And so they grow new dendrites and reach out and attach and innervate those previously uninnervated or these now uninnervated muscle fibers. And if it happens to grab, say, a, say imagine it is a slow motor unit, and it reaches out and grabs some, no, some new fast twitch motor fibers and brings it into its motor unit, those fibers are then going to change into be slow. So what happens here are images like this, where normally you have this uh, mix and matching of fast twitch, slow twitch, kind of everywhere spread out evenly throughout the muscle. And what happens in the case of grouping is because so many neurons die out, you get these big chunks of like fibers. So, you know, huge chunks of 20 or 30 or 50 fibers that are all the same fiber type in big bundles. This is one of the things that leads to lock, lack of mo fine-tuned motor control or motor movement. So, not only do we know it's physiologically possible to change these fibers, we also know that it happens under certain normal, if you will, certain situations. It's, it's not healthy, but it is normal. So, really, to clarify the question, and I, I actually will try not to get on too much of a tangent right here, but this is a great example of a lot of the miscommunication in science and otherwise simply comes down to asking bad questions. So the question of do fiber types change is a terrible question. It's not even remotely debatable. Of course they change. The more specific and question that people are generally trying to ask when they ask that is, okay, well, do they change with different types of exercise training? This actual question about the plasticity of fiber types with different types of exercise training has been actually around for a very long time. In fact, in early, early 19, uh, early, late 1960s, early 1970s, a very famous physiologist, muscle physiologist um, named Dr. Edgerton, 
came up with a beautiful study and he wanted to answer this question. So he looked at the animal models and he used histochemistry and he said, okay, what if I put these animals through some swim training? And so I don't know if this is actually a picture of the actual study, although obviously it's not. But this is effectively what happens. In, in fact, you could look elsewhere to figure out what it actually takes to swim train a, a mouse and it's not that great, but nonetheless. So he did this first initial study in 1969 and said whether or not fiber types change with exercise training. And then he found no, essentially nothing. So no change at all. A couple of years later, another uh, extremely famous uh, muscle physiologist, um, Dr. Galnick, came out with a study that said, okay, let, let's just simply compare athletically trained people to non-athletically trained to see if they have different fiber type profiles. So what, he's, he, what he did is, is took sedentary individuals and compared their muscle at rest to uh, endurance run trained individuals. And what he found was a significant difference. In fact, what he found is those that were highly endurance trained had way more of these slow twitch fibers. Keep one thing in mind though, take a look at that image. What do you automatically know about that image? This is histochemistry, right? Black, white. So although well, this is very, very important, we have to keep in mind the limitations. All this simply told us was one, there was more slow twitch now than fast twitch. It didn't give us any of that specificity. And two, we can't necessarily say whether this was nature or nurture because we don't know what either one of these people looked like. So in other words, the athletes could have simply been born with more slow twitch, so they chose to engage in endurance activities because they were pre-genetically supposed to be better at them. But it was still an awesome paper, uh, an amazing study, and provided, provided a lot of great information. So being the phenomenal scientist Dr. Galnick was, he said, let me follow it up and actually do a training study. So in this time, instead of comparing sedentary people to endurance trained people, let's take sedentary people and endurance train them and see what happens over time. Well, unfortunately, he found no change at all in either the type 1s or the type 2s. Again, notice the terminology. Type, type 1, 2, histochemistry, right? And in fact, just to summarize a, about a decade of research for you, up to 1976, here's what we knew about this question. Number one, there were definitely correlations between fiber type profile and performance. We knew that those that had more slow fibers had better endurance. And in the inverse had actually been shown several times as well. Those that were, had more fast fibers were faster, stronger, better at more anaerobic sports. So that part was clear in humans at this point. We also know that inactivity, things like uh, nerve cutting or, or massive inactivity, the stuff that I showed you at the very beginning, simulations, um, all that stuff did cause the fibers to change. But fiber types did not change with exercise training in humans. So this had been done several times with different endurance training stuff. There was also a fantastic paper by Thorsenson and their group in 1975 that showed sprint training didn't either. So we know fiber type correlates to performance. It changes in very weird simulations and cutting of nerves and, and pathologies, but it's not changing with exercise training. In fact, I think most of the people that make comments about this and write chapters and things online, I think they must have stopped doing their research at this point. Because up to this time, it was a pretty clear answer and it made a lot of sense. Unfortunately, a lot's changed since 1976. In fact, just a few late years later, a couple of different groups did a series of really, really interesting studies. Uh, these were done in both endurance running and endurance cycling. And they, just to summarize sort of everything, they wanted to know, do the type 1s, 2As, and 2Bs change? Now remember, I'm using type 2B, not 2X, because at the time, they were referring them to type 2B. We now know them to be 2X, but either way. We're also using type, so we know they used histochemistry here. So what they found was no change in the type 1 fibers, but an increase in 2A and a decrease in 2B. Aha! Enter the controversy. Enter you pulling your hair out by, by your own threads because people are now having all this evidence for years to suggest they don't change and all of a sudden the next year two different papers show it changed? Well, what happened? Remember the major limitation of histochemistry for fiber typing purposes was it lacked specificity. This is going to be a major por portion of what we're talking about here. We have to split things up into 1 or 2B at most to get 2A and 2B, we have to call them black, white, and then some level of gray there. 
hold that thought. An amazing study in 1978 came out, and if you've ever done a study before or think you've had a hard workout, picture what it must have been like to be in this study. So this was a training study. I believe it was eight weeks long. What they, or Sorry, much longer than that. But what they effectively did is let's try four different training styles back to back to back, and let's take biopsies in between all of them and see what happens over time. And what they noticed was after weeks of jogging training, and then a biopsy, and then sprint training, and a biopsy, and then jogging, biopsy, sprint training, was a transition from type 2-1 to, to your intermediates, when you went from jogging to sprint training, and then from your type 2 intermediates back to type 1s when you did more endurance training. So this is initially an, in an indication that maybe sprinting type training causes us to transition from type 1 to type 2C, which remember earlier, we think the hybrids are simply fibers caught transitioning from, in this case, a 1 to a 2A. But then when we started doing the steady state endurance training again, and for the record, this is the jogging stuff was probably, I can't remember exactly, but it was most likely something like 30 to 60 minutes of, of, of 5 to 6 days a week or somewhere like that at a consistent pace. So not intervals. Sprinting was more of the interval type of stuff. But nonetheless, when we do the jogging stuff like right here, we go from the two C's more towards the type ones, indicating that type of training causes a conversion back to slow twitch. Well, they further elucidated and extrapolated a little bit and suggested what's actually happening is exactly what I alluded to. So during the sprint training, we're trying to transition from a one all the way to a two B, two X, right? Then when we start the jogging training again, we actually make our way back from being a two B or a two X all the way down to our original type one. This was the first study that really, uh, in a complex fashion, outlined what's possible in that not only is there a conversion with exercise training, but it's happening back and forth. So our conclusions out of 1978 are a little bit different than those in 1976. So number one, fibers actually quickly change with exercise training, but only if typed with high specificity. So in this particular study and the one before, and, but in this one even more so, when we allow ourselves to identify these hybrid or in-between fibers, now we start to see change. But when we use the paper like the Golnick study that only allowed us to do, say, one and two, we don't notice a change. So more specific, more accurate fiber typing methods are now leading to us, are giving us the ability to pick up on the changes in fiber type with exercise. Number two, when we do endurance type of training, we, it looks like we're seeing a fast to slow twitch transition, and when we do anaerobic training, we see the opposite of slow to fast transition. We're going to jump all the way up to 1994. So a classic paper by Anderson and their colleagues came out in this day. And in fact, what's interesting about this and the reason we're skipping all the way up to now is the answer hasn't really been different since this original 1994 paper. The reason I'm making this video in 2016, though, is for some reason people still haven't gotten this memo. So it hasn't really changed since 94 to now. In fact, almost every study that's used the proper methodology has seen the exact same result for the most part. If you adopt a sedentary lifestyle, this would be uh, maybe some minimal physical activity, but no or very limited structure to exercise. Whether this is a party lifestyle, nutrition, sleeping or not, that doesn't really matter. And, and it also doesn't appear to matter what gender, age, what muscle group we test. As you increase, or I should say, as you decrease your physical activity, the amount of hybrid fibers you have increases. So your pure type 1s or your pure 2As start being converted into the type 1 2As and the type 2A 2Xs or even in, in theory the 1 2A 2X. All right. Uh, so if you want a little bit more science, my, my colleague, Dr. Jimmy Bagley, published a phenomenal uh, literature review on this topic. And I think his graph highlights it quite clearly. So what he did is each one of these different colored bars is a different study. So you see he's representing eight studies here, but he certainly looked at all of them. And over the last, say, almost 25 to 30 years of research in this area, whenever we use the single fiber uh, electrophoresis method, this, which is the only one that allows us to actually accurately identify these hybrids, we always see this pattern. When you're physically inactive, the peers go down, the ones in the two ways. Well, at the same time, 
the total hybrids go up. Now, we don't exactly know why. We're totally guessing. But the speculation is you've got hybrids or you've got fibers that are sitting there basically saying, like, what do you want me to do? Do you want me to be really fatigue resistant or do you want me to be really powerful? Right? Both end of our spectrums. Well, if you're not going to tell me what to do, I'm going to sort of sit here in the middle. I don't want to have any specificity in function because I don't have any specificity in direction. Tell me you want me to be oxidative, fatigue resistant. Tell me to be slow twitch. I'll move there. Tell me to be fast twitch. I'll move there. But until you tell me what to do, probably the most evolutionarily advantageous thing is to sit somewhere in the middle. Right? So to summarize that, activity equals specific changes and less hybrids. So the inverse is actually happening. It doesn't necessarily matter whether you pick uh, resistance exercise, intervals, biking, running, swimming, strength training, or, or any combination. In fact, very little has been done outside of those, those standard areas of your classic resistance exercise, three sets of 10 type of stuff, your classic steady state endurance, a little bit of stuff on some intervals, but not much. All the other types of training that we know exist haven't been examined, but it seems to really not matter. Any sort of physical activity, any sort of rigorous exercise causes specific changes and a decrease in hybrids. Endurance type of training looks like it will slightly increase the type amount of type ones you have and, and more speed, strength, power-based exercises seems to increase the type two ways you have. So the changes are specific to the type of training you're doing, but regardless of that, the hybrids go down. All right. So again, these hybrids provide some level of specificity in your training, and this is probably why uh, we have them around, or it's why it's a little bit advantageous to have the ability to kind of flip-flop. I will tell you, very, very few laboratories are, 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 are focusing on this area, so we have a ton still to learn. But it's really, at this point, unquestionable whether or not physical activity or any kind of training can cause a fiber-type transformation. It's just been shown in every study that's used the accurate fiber typing methods for the last two and a half decades, right? Over 30 studies now, probably getting closer to 40 or maybe even 50. In fact, to highlight this even more, a, a figure that Dr. Bagley and I are working on, perhaps by the time you see this video, this will be published. But what this really shows is, again, a, com a composite of a bunch of different studies, and, and it kind of puts athletes on different spectrums. I'm not going to walk you through this, through this entire slide, but you can pause it and take a look at it yourself. But basically what we're showing here is more or less hybrids, right? Those that are physically trained have less hybrid. Those are inactive, sedentary, maybe recreationally active, tend to have more. Those that have more fast twitch fibers, competitive sprinters, bodybuilders, and those over here, runners, distance runners, distance runners, have more slow twitch. Up to this point, we have pretty good information on the fiber type qualities of your steady state endurance athletes, swimmers, cyclists, and runners. We also had a decent amount on power lifters, weight lifters, some bodybuilders, but we never had any information about people in the middle. If you look at the sport of mixed martial arts, it's really complicated because of course athletes have to be very fast, but at the championship level like this individual athlete, you gotta be able to prepare to fight for 25 minutes. So this is maximal heart rate up and down. This is your worst interval workout. You're 10 seconds on, 10 seconds off, but you gotta do it for 25 minutes. So you have to be fast, strong, of course, technically and tactically sound, but you have to also have some massive endurance abilities. So what's an athlete look like from the fiber type level that has these super high strength and power qualities, but at the same time has the ability to repeat maximal effort over and over and over and over again. Does that mean they just have a lot of fast twitch fibers that are really in, have a lot of endurance quality? Do they have a lot of slow twitch fibers but generate force some other way? Or is it totally different? Well, it turns out in this particular study, you can see the athlete right here in purple. Most individuals have about 20 to 40, 50% of their muscle fibers are slow twitch. That would be pretty normal. So you can see in the yellow bar here is sedentary, gray is untrained, white is recreationally active. There seems to be a normal number of about 30 or 40 percent of the individual muscle fibers coming from slow twitch. Most people, again, you'll see the your yellow and gray bar and white out here, have somewhere between 20 to 30 to 40 percent of their fibers in any of the hybrid states. So that's what total hybrid means. 
And with most people being somewhere between, hey, 10 to 20% one, two A's, 10 to 20% two A, two X, somewhere in there. That would leave most people in the yellow, gray, and white bars, again, being somewhere between 20 and 40% fast twitch. This fighter, however, was almost 70% pure 2A. This is incredibly high. We almost never see this high, and we would certainly never see it in an athlete that has to also simultaneously maintain so much of an endurance performance background. Right? You'll also notice out here the two X's, and we'll get to that in a little bit later. But this is what made us really start to question these things and start to think about, you know what? Maybe simply studying your swimmers, triathlons, and endurance runners, comparing those to bodybuilders, maybe that's not telling us the whole answer or, or providing us all the information we need to know about the importance of muscle fiber types. All right, so what about things like weightlifters? We still don't have any accurate fiber typing data on competitive weightlifters. What about folks that do things that are more interval based or mixed methods? So some people that maybe do uh, a kettlebell or dumbbell workout one day and then do high intensity intervals, uh, sprint, uh, hill sprints one day, then maybe go to the pool and swim for an hour the next day, heavy deadlifts the, the last day. We don't have any idea what those mixed or, or multiple combinations look like. We don't have any idea, surprising enough, you would think this is true, but we don't know what the fiber type profile looks up of a professional baseball player. How about a professional basketball? No idea. These have actually never been done. We've got a complete dearth of information in that area. We also can't answer very practical training questions like the one you see down here. What if you go to the gym and do three sets of 15? Is that going to cause the same fiber type profile as 15 sets of three? How about five sets of six? I don't have any idea. We certainly know that those give different outcome measures, right? But we don't know if that's actually causing a difference in fiber type transformation or not. My point on this is, although we do know quite a bit and there's almost no way we can question the overall plasticity of muscle fiber types with physical activity, we have way more questions about this than we'll ever know answers. We, have, we haven't yet to examine gender. Almost no information is available on the muscle fiber types of females. Literally a handful, a small couple of studies have been done on females. We also don't know about muscles. I would say 90% or more of the studies on fiber type have been done in what's called the vastus lateralis, this huge muscle out here on this amazing athlete, right? the lateral quadricep muscle. There's been a little bit done on the gastroc, which is this big muscle right here in your calf, and the soleus, which is a smaller one in your calf. A tiny bit on the deltoid, which is your shoulder. Uh, a little bit on the triceps, the back of your arm, and the biceps, but almost minimal in those areas. Right. What about glutes, hamstrings, right? all the other areas, traps, lats, we have forearms. We have almost no information at all. There's some stuff from the 90s and before looking at cadavers, but nothing in live humans, and nothing at all in this specificity, with this specificity. And then to make it even worse, what about nutrition? What about high carb diets, high fat diets, high protein, low protein, fasting diets, timing diets, eating at night but not at, in the day, things like this. We have absolutely no information at all in those areas. So I can't in good faith give you any suggestions about what those types of things do to your fiber type profile. So to wrap this stuff all up, in summary, do muscle fiber types change? Well, I hope at this point you're pretty convinced that, yes, of course they do. And I don't really think it's even questionable. Well, no, I know it's not questionable at all. We do see a, a, a quite excessive transition into fast, so it does seem that your fast twitch fibers are much more pliable. Uh, you'll get bigger changes and it'll happen much faster. Now, some people will still tell, tell you that you can't transition into slow, which is completely bogus, but I will admit that it is much less prevalent. It seems to either take a much longer time frame or a much more severe situation. So you're, you're not necessarily going to transition as easily into slow twitch as you are fast twitch, but it is still possible with exercise training to have that. And since you all like details, and I, this is one of the most common questions I get, you want to know how much can it change? Are we talking a 1% change or 800% change? Well, I don't know, right? We don't have any long-term studies. Uh, we don't really have too many things that are more than like 12 weeks, to be honest. So I'll give you some rough numbers here, and these are highly variable. 
But I would say something like if the if the training is less than a year long, you're probably looking at 20 to 30 percent or less of a change. So if you're 40 percent 2A, you after a year of training you might be 50, 55 percent. I I really don't know. We see you more like an 8 percent change over 12 weeks, but that's probably not going to continue on for forever. I, I just don't know. What I do know though is after a year those numbers can become enormous. We have situations, in fact, where some individuals under extreme situations, uh, these would be things like people with a spinal cord injury where a, a, a hamstring or a glutes not activated for 10 years or more, we see 30, 40, 50, 80 percent changes in fiber type. So that's the best I can give you. I know that might be a touch frustrating, but hey, that's, the, that's where science is at right now. If you want to do something about it, let me know. We're trying to, right? but we need some help. Some really exciting new information in the last couple of years has showed us that, in fact, maybe there's more to these fast and slow twitch fibers than we originally thought. So this is an idea uh, called the nuclear domain. This is, these are beautiful images. So take a look at these two fibers over here. Right? One of them is a fast twitch and one of them is a slow twitch fiber. What we now know are things like there are differences in the amount of nuclei. It, it looks like at this point slow twitch fibers have more nuclei. Remember that from the very beginning? The nuclei would hold your DNA, tell your cell to grow, shrink, replicate. It also looks like your slow twitch fibers have more satellite cells. So satellite cells sit on the outside of the, of the fiber or the cell. And when you need more nuclei, they move in, get differentiated, and become a nuclei. All right, so this is, uh, if you're not familiar with satellite cells, this is one of the most hottest topics in all of physiology right now, one of the hottest ones. Uh, because it seems to be like that's one of your major limiters for plasticity. Once you run out of sat satellite cells, you, can, you can't differentiate into mononuclei. You don't have any nuclei, you can't grow, shrink, repair. Right? With all that in mind, it seems like the mononuclear domain size is larger in your fast twitch fibers. So a the mononuclear domain basically says, okay, how much domain or how much space does each nuclei control? A smaller Myonuclear domain appears at this point to be advantageous because that means each nuclei is controlling a smaller region. This just means you're going to have faster replies. So imagine you open up a business and you have another office in Vancouver and another one in South Africa. Well, if you have a regional manager set up at every location, when a printer goes out or a phone line breaks, it's very easy to repair those things. But if you only have one center controlling you know, an entire continent, it's very slow to make changes. All right, so now, uh, we're just uncovering these things. You, you can see this paper just came out in 2015. There's more and more coming out, but it's a really exciting area that, in fact, we're working on, too. Uh, but that's about as much as we know at this point. We have almost done nothing in the area of humans, and so we'll see if this holds true uh, in our space as well or what other things we can uncover. So, uh, at this point, in the video, we've had a full discussion of what fiber types are, and I think we've made it pretty clear that whether or not they change with exercise, and of course our answer is yes, and in both directions.